So in section 3.3, one of the things that we're going to uh, work on is if we can just look at a polynomial, we should be able to know some things about its basic shape. And that's, that's the idea today. And we're going to talk about power functions and polynomial functions. So polynomials are defined this way. Polynomials come in this form. And I know that this is a bit of gobbledygook. A sub n, this is a coefficient. This is just a number. Um, this is the nth coefficient. This is the n minus 1th coefficient. This is the zeroth. These are just going to be numbers. And then you have x to some power plus x to some lesser power, and it descends on down. So polynomials, you're used to, you're used to them. Here's some examples of polynomials, some things like this. Uh, each of these would be polynomials. So notice that it's I, these ones are written in this form, where I have this descending power on the variable and then some coefficients. So a couple things uh, that I want to talk about here, just some, some words that we'll be using, is the idea of the degree. Uh, the degree of a polynomial is the, the, the highest degree that's of any term. So we would say this is a third degree polynomial. So this is the degree. And the leading coefficient is just the number that's out front there of um, the term with the largest degree. So the leading coefficient here is 3. Uh, in this case, the degrees 15, the leading coefficient is negative 3 ninths. In this case, we might have to work for it a little bit. Like we would have to, we could multiply this out if we wanted it in the form like the other ones, if we wanted it in this form. But what I want you to notice is our leading term is going to be x times x times 3x. So x times x times 3x, we know that the first term here would be 3x cubed. So the degree is 3, and the leading coefficient is 3 in this case. Okay, so there's just the idea of a polynomial function. A power function is just basically a single term. Like, um, it's a polynomial function that only has one term in it. So like, if I just had 3x to the fifth, that's a power function. It doesn't have all the other extra stuff that goes with it. And the thing about power functions is power functions give you a lot of information about the, uh, the actual polynomial, like the power function part of it. And here is an example of what I mean. Like this 3x cubed, as x gets really large, you're cubing a really large number, this starts to dominate the equation. Like when x is a million, 3 times a million cubed is significantly bigger than 5 times a million squared. And if that's not big enough, make it a billion. This thing starts to be all the weight, and these other terms become uh, less significant to it. So thinking about that is going to help us think about um, how we can think about the shapes of these just by looking at, looking at what they say. So here are two equations this 5x cubed plus 3x squared plus 7, and then negative 5x cubed plus 3x squared plus 7. So what I want to talk about right now is the end behavior. And what end behavior describes is, like if I was graphing this, as x gets really big, basically as x approaches infinity, and as x gets really big in the negative direction, as x approaches negative infinity, what does this shape tend to do? Does it tend to go up? Does it tend to go up, down? Um, so let's just let's just think about that let x get really big like you have a really big positive number and you cube it it's even bigger positive and then you multiply it by five it's gonna go up like it's gonna go up so to the right it will end up going up or we could say as x approaches infinity right as it travels to the right x is getting bigger and bigger y will tend towards infinity as well I notice we can, we, we can ignore all this. We're just looking at this first term. And same thing here. If I ignore all this, just look at this first term, what I notice is positive numbers to the third are going to be big positive numbers. But then I'm multiplying by negative 5. So in this case, as I head to the right, it's going to go downward because it's going to be a bigger and bigger negative number going down. So I would say as x approaches infinity, uh, positive infinity, y approaches negative infinity. It goes down in that direction. And I'm using y here. Uh, your textbook might use f of x in place of y. So it might look like this. But it's the same thing. As the inputs approach infinity, what do the outputs do? And notice the way that we can determine the right-hand side of the end behavior 
is just with that leading coefficient. If the leading coefficient is positive, it's going to go up. And if the leading coefficient is negative, it's going to go down as we go to the right. So let's make a little note about that, about n behavior. So if that leading coefficient is greater than zero, if it's positive, then as x approaches infinity, notice that, says, that means we're going to the right, x is, x is approaching positive infinity, y approaches infinity, that means we're going up. Um, if that leading coefficient is less than zero, negative, then as we go to the right, it'll go down. So that's the right-hand side. And now let's talk about the left-hand side. And the left-hand side, uh, or in other words, as x uh, approaches negative infinity, what will happen to the shape? And uh, we actually don't use leading coefficient for this. We actually use the degree. And I think I'll pull up Desmos here and do some graphing and see what happens. So here is a graph of uh, f of x equals x. Notice it goes up to the right, but it's going down to the left. Right? As I go to the left, it goes down. As I approach negative infinity, this approaches negative infinity. Um, and now if I look at squared, so I'm just going to multiply this by x. So now I have x squared. Notice what happens. It still goes up to the right, but now it's going up to the left. And now if I do this again, if I, if I cube it, it switches again, going down to the left, right, up to the right. And if I go fourth degree, and I'll look, in fifth degree, it alternates. So you can think about odd and even numbers. So if it's odd, they're going to go in opposite directions. And if it's even, they're going to go in the same direction. And even if, like, if this leading coefficient is negative, they're both going down. So if they're even, they go the same direction. If they're odd, they go opposite direction. So we can think about, we can think about linking this left behavior to the right behavior. We can look at the leading coefficient, positive or negative, up or down. Then we can look at the degree. So if n is even, right, ends the degree of the polynomial, then as this happens, um, as x goes to the right, and I don't even need that part, I'll just say uh, left is the same as the right, and if n is odd, I could say left is the opposite of the right. So thinking about that, if I had an equation that said Let's say um, that polynomial. I know a couple things about it just by this leading term, right? I know that since this is positive, it must be going up as the equation goes to the right. So this positiveness tells me um, as x is going in the positive direction, right, as x approaches positive infinity, this thing goes up. It just becomes a bigger and bigger positive number. So y approaches positive infinity. As x's do this, y's do that. So I know it's going to go up in that direction. And then I can look at the degree. Since this degree is odd, that means they must do opposite things. So I would say as x approaches negative infinity, uh, y does the opposite. So y, uh, y does the opposite of the other y, right? It goes down instead of up. y approaches negative infinity. That would be that. You know, if I do this, do this again with a different one, blah, blah, blah. If I have something like this, and I just wrote this because I don't, you know, I'm going to ignore all those. I'm just looking at the leading term for this. Since this is negative 8, take a really big x number, take it to the 16th power. It's really big positive, but then you multiply it by negative, it, gets, it makes it go negative. So as we go to the right, as x goes to positive infinity, y is going to go towards negative infinity. And then I can look at this. That's an even number, so they're going to be the same. So as x goes to the left, y will do the same thing as it did when it went to the right, so it will also go to negative infinity. So we've got some information about n behavior. In other words, just by looking at this, I know that this graph is going to go like this and this. Notice I don't know anything about what's happening in between them. Um, we'll, we'll get to some possibilities. And I also don't have any idea right now about x-intercepts. But I know about its end behavior. I know about its extreme behavior. So let's get at some other things that knowing the degree can tell me. So if I have uh, x squared, 
notice it has one term in it, one turn in it, right? It turns each direction once. And even if I go like plus 4x uh, plus 3, like no matter how I change this number or make this negative out here, um, it's going to have just one, one turn in it, okay? So let's make this a cubic and see what happens, third, third degree. So now if it is a third degree, it has a turns here and it turns here. It has two turns in it. Interesting. If I make it a fourth degree, well, that only has one term in it. I wonder if I could make other turns happen here. This has one, two, three turns in it. So hopefully you're starting to see that like the degree and the number of turns are related to each other. And the number of turns is one less than the degree. So there's another thing we, we know. Um, the number of turns or the number of maximum and minimums. And it's not the exact number. It's actually the maximum number of turns. It could have less. It's one less than the degree. So if I go back and look, say, at this one right here. Well, let's see. Uh, that 5 is positive. I know it's going to go up to the right because that's positive. This is odd, so I know it's going to go down to the left because it's opposite. I'm just going to make something up. Um, now, the max number of turns. The max number of turns this will have is 2. So it could have 2 turns in it. It might have none, right? But it's not going to have any more than 2. One less than the degree. And just, just for the record, just to remember, um, when we're talking about polynomials, remember that degree is the leading in the leading term if these are in descending orders, so, right? It's the biggest power that we have with a single turn. So the max number of turns is that. Now, let's take a good look again at this, say this equation, the max number of turns. Now let's talk about the max number of zeros. Zeros are x-intercepts. Zeros are where it crosses the x-axis. So notice this has two, but I think it has the potential for more. The shape itself, I could move this shape down by, instead of saying plus three, maybe say, uh, just make that a zero. And now notice one, two, three, Four. I've got four zeros, four x-intercepts. They're called zeros because they're, they're like the outputs are zeros. The y is equal to zero. And hopefully, having four zeros, hopefully you can see that that is the most. Because if there's three turns, if it changes direction three times, the most times it can cross this is four. And that's a nice symmetry. That actually matches our degree. So, our max number of zeros uh, also know it has x intercepts or when y equals zero is the actual degree so like this third degree polynomial will have at most three turns uh, three zeros in it this 15th degree could have up to 15 zeros and so on this one notice it's x times x times x x cubed will have at most three and this factored form actually tells us something about where those zeros happen. Um, if we can write this in factored form, we're saying, when does that equal zero? Well, you have things multiplied together to give you zero. So how about this? When x is negative 5, that makes this a zero, right? It'd be zero times some number times some number. That'd give me zero. What makes this a zero? 7. When x is 7... 7 times some number times some number, boom. And if I could think about this, what makes this a 0? 3x plus 5 equals 0. I'll subtract 5, divide by 3, negative 5 thirds. Not only does this have three zeros, I found them all, right? Because it came to me in this factored form. So if I'm given something in factored form, I can actually find where those zeros are at as well. So we've got a couple of pieces here. We know some stuff about the end behavior. We know something about the max number of turns, how it's related to the degree, and the max number of zeros. So let's think about something like this. What is the, this actually could have a lot of different things as its degrees, but what's the smallest possible degree it could have? Well, it has two turns, 
So the smallest degree would be 3. This could be something x cubed plus something. It could be x fifth. It could be, it could be other numbers as well. But the smallest degree this could possibly be is 3 because it has two turns. Um, if I had one that looks like this, say that's my graph. I know a couple things. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 turns. So the smallest possible degree would be 6. I also know whatever number's out here is negative, right? Because it's going down to the right. And that 6 matches that they're going the same direction because it's even. So let's think about everything we can possibly think about with this graph. Uh, first off, I know that it's going to go down to the right, right? As x approaches infinity, y approaches negative infinity. Because this multiplier out here is negative, so it would have a negative uh, coefficient. What's the degree of this? Well, if I were to multiply it out, x times x times x times x is x to the fourth. I know my first term is going to be x to the fourth plus a bunch of stuff. So that x to the fourth, if it goes down to the right, it goes down to the left as well. So wherever my equation is at, it's going to go, end up going down to the left and down to the right. Let's see where the zero is at. It should have at most four and most three turns. So what makes this a zero? Negative four. What makes this a zero? One. What makes this a zero? Three. What makes this a zero? Negative eight. So if I had this point here at negative eight, uh, this point at negative four, point at one, and a point at 3, and I don't know how high or low these turns happen. Like, I have no idea, but I could do something like that. Good fourth degree polynomial with, um, I'll mark those, negative 8, negative 4, negative, uh, positive 1, positive 3, sorry. So if it comes to me in factored form, I can find those zeros real easily. Um, if it doesn't, sometimes I need to do a little work for it. So, like, let's say I'm told f of x is equal to x times x squared minus 3x minus 4. Something like that. Well, if I distribute this, this is an x cubed, so it should have at most three zeros. Could have less. Uh, could have fewer. So, uh, let's see. I've got x times, let me factor this. Uh, things that multiply to negative 4 add to negative 3 would be negative 4 and 1. x minus 4 x plus 1. So what makes this a 0? Zero? 0. What makes this a 0? 4. What makes this a 0? Negative 1. So my zeros would happen when x is 0, x is 4, and x is negative 1. I'm going to do one more like this. x to the 4th minus 81. Fourth degree should go up to the right. That's positive. Should go the same direction to the left. Could have at most four zeros. Um, could have less at most three turns, right? One, two, three, something like that. Who knows what it actually looks like? Let's factor this. Uh, difference of squares. Difference of squares. Like x to the fourth is x squared squared. 81 is 9 squared. So I could write this as uh, x squared plus 9 times x squared minus 9. That's good. Uh, this is prime, but this is difference of squares again, right? x squared minus 3 squared. So this could be x squared plus 9 times x plus 3 times x minus 3. So get my zeros off of here. This gives me negative 3. What makes that a 0? This gives me positive 3. What makes that a 0? Uh, x squared plus 9 equals 0. There's no real solution to that. Because if I subtract 9, I get x squared equals negative 9. Square root of negative 9, not going to give me a real number. So this would have zeros there and there. All right. Hey, give those practice problems a try. Post me questions or message them to me and uh, let me know how it's going.